Good afternoon, folks. Welcome back to Advanced Higher Chemistry. This is going to be a bit of a magnum opus, or as Baldrick would call it, a magnificent octopus. If you haven't seen Black Arrow, by the way, your homework is to go away and watch it. Today, we're going to be tackling the research and chemistry section of the course. Not the project content. That, currently, as of time of video, isn't running and hasn't run for two years now. I'm hoping it's going to come back, but that's your problem in the classroom. Today, we're... We're looking at the practical experiment knowledge that you're required to know uh, from the course. It's approximately 10% of your exam mark, which, as my son was quite correctly pointing out, is enough to bop you up or down by almost a grade, in fact. Possibly, yeah, a grade. And it's composed of these five basic areas. Uh, I'm go I have cheated in this one. It's SQA page 107 through to 125, 18 pages worth. So this video here looks like it's going to be massive, but it's not because three and two I already have done, which is good news. Let's focus on some basics first. I've got a cheat sheet here. I've got the quick version um, for me to refer to, and I've starred some things here just uh, so I can not ramble too much as I go through this. So basics and stoichiometric calculations, that's the first sections. So the basics are they expect you to be able to know how to use all the pieces of a lab equipment. That sort of overlaps into um, the, the content here because they say you've got to be able to identify and eliminate rogue points. Uh, let's, let's pretend I'm semi-professional and skip to a fresh page for number one, shall we? Let's keep that down there for later. So, basics. Rogue points. Now, they're famous for doing this at higher. If they present you with a graph, that's got separate points that looks pretty much like this, then they're expecting you to do identify this as... Oh, nice one, hey, I'm just getting an ink all over the place. They're expecting you to identify this as a rogue point and ignore it and draw a nice straight line through the rest of the points. Not quite straight, but give me a break. So, rogue points, ignore them. Simple as that. Uh, equipment. They're expecting you to be able to appreciate the relative accuracy of apparatus used to make the, measure the volume of liquids. Don't be using a beaker when you're doing titrations <laughs> for pouring your liquids out of. So in order of ultimate accuracy at the top of the deck, we have got two seconds, please. I'm just going to shush my wife's phone because it's going to bing bong through all this video otherwise. <laughs> right, no more bing bongs. Okay. Um, as I said, in order of uh, hierarchy, at the top here, you've got pipettes. They are the most accurate. That's not how you spell pipette, hey? You daft old fool. Pipette is the most accurate way of measuring a volume of liquid. The only downside is they are precise volumes, like 5 or 10 or 20. So therefore, further down the tree, we have a burette. All these wonderful French words, eh? Um, a burette is accurate. This is accurate to within something ridiculous, by the way. If you go and look it up, it's something like 0.01 of a milliliter. Something ridiculous like that. You'll need that when you come through your projects because you can do percentage uncertainties with it. Once the projects come back, in the future, hopefully. A burette is accurate to within 0.1 of a centimeter cubed, which is 10 times less accurate than this, but still way better than the next one down, which is a measuring cylinder. They vary in their accuracy depending on the scale. And then down the bottom of the depths of depravity here, we've got beakers because they just suck. You can take the word of a beaker with a pinch of salt. It's about as believable as your average politician's excuse. Um, so basics, rogue points, volumetric and accuracy, a, a control. Oh, yes, a control. I'm not sure I actually talk about this in my volumetric analysis video. So... What is a control and where would you get one from? Well, a classic case of this is if I have an aspirin tablet uh, that I bought in the shops and I'm doing a volumetric analysis on the aspirin to see how close it is to the 300 milligrams that they say on the label, then I might get an answer of 297 milligrams, which on the surface looks great. But unless I've checked my actual techniques accuracy, not the actual number here, the accuracy of my actual titration technique, then I can't guarantee that that is correct. How do I actually do that? Well, 
I would go and measure off the shelf in the storeroom cupboard 300 milligrams of acetyl salicylic acid and then I would do the same titration on exactly that mass. I know for sure that it's that mass that I've weighed out. What does my answer come out to? Say it comes out to 297, for example, milligrams, then that agrees with my experimental result. So the control, basically, you get from the chemistry stockroom. That's where you get your control chemicals from. You know, you go and buy them. And you can buy them at 99.999% purity. Uh, and then you run that through your experiment. And you just check that your experiment is giving you the right result. If you weigh it at 300 milligrams and you do the experiment and you have apparently end up with an answer of only 200 milligrams, your experiment sucks. And you can't make any conclusions at all from your numbers. So that's why we need to do controls. What's next under stereochemetric calculations? What did I put a little star on? Oh, yes. Uh, there are three... The SQA have thrown three things at us here, which no self-respecting chemist ever uses. So I don't know why they've done this. Percentage mass. This is for a solution, by the way. So this is, say, a 20% solution by mass. Yeah, my deep sigh is because chemists don't do percentage solutions by mass. We do them in moles per litre. Okay, so the SQA's definition of this is the mass of the solute made up to 100 centimetres cubed of solution. So in other words, if I wanted a 20% salt solution by mass, then I would um, put 20 grams of sodium chloride into a beaker, and then I would make up the rest, uh, into a beaker, ha, <laughs> wash your mouth out, hey, I would put it into a volumetric flask, sorry, and then I would make up to the mark to exactly 100 centimetres cubed. Now, look at this terrible mishmash of units. This is why I despair of the SQA sometimes. I don't know why they want this, but they want you to know it. Also, a famous trick question perhaps would be, weigh out 20 grams, measure 100 centimetres cubed, and then mix them together. Now, that's wrong, because this has a certain volume by itself. It takes up some space. So that's why I said to put it into the volumetric flask and then make up to the mark. So don't fall for that little twisted question. Um, percentage by volume is the other weird um, thing the SQA wants you to know. They say it's the number of centimetres cubed made up to 100 centimetres cubed. So <laughs> a 20% solution by volume of, say, ethanol, because that's a liquid at room temperature the last time I checked. Uh, that would be volumetric flask. Let's get my diagram right this time. Eh? Hey. Even that's not a volumetric flask, but give me a break. So we would, we would measure out with a pipette 20, exactly 20.0 20 centimetres cubed of the ethanol. And then you would make up to the mark the rest with H2O up to 100 centimetres cubed. Should have put, oh yeah, there we go. We've got 100 centimetres cubed on here as well. So these are two weird, very unique uh, and you know what the SQA are like, they'll just throw out a one mark question in somewhere on it here, so I just thought I'd prepare you for it. And the last weird thing that the SQA want you to use is a unit called PPM. So there are two different definitions of PPM according to the gurus and the Scottish Qualifications Authority, and they say it can be one milligram per kilogram of substance, which sort of makes sense. If you do the maths, PPM, sorry by the way, starts stands for, here's me slagging off the SQA and I haven't even told you. What an amateur. Parts per million. That's what that stands for. And it's a ratio of the thing you're looking for. For example, parts per million of sulfur dioxide in the air. Or parts per million of aluminium in drinking water. Um, one milligram per kilogram of substance. And that does make sense because that's a mass. That's a mass. So that would truly be one millionth of that if you do the sums. They also expect you to realise it can mean this, one milligram per litre. Now, that's actually only mathematically true if you're dealing with something where a litre is a kilogram. And that's true for water, but it's not true for almost everything else. So these are the two definitions of PPM. 
I'll stop whining and we'll move back to our first page. Have I finished the first? Yes, I have. That's the first one done. Okay, so. Uh, basics and stoichiometric calculations. The next one down, gravimetric analysis. Now, the really good news from my point of view is I have actually done a video on this a year ago during the last of our pandemic problems. I'll try and put a link up here and I'll also put a link down in the doobly-doo down below in case you're not getting the pop-ups. Um, so gravimetric analysis is done. It covers, it covers concepts like primary standards. It turns out many chemicals are lying to you. If you weigh out 40 grams of sodium hydroxide, which is a classic one for making up solutions, you don't have 40 grams of sodium hydroxide. You have always got less than 40. I'll let you go and watch the video and I'll explain why. It covers primary standards, it covers how to do titrations, and it covers how to do something called a back titration as well. Um, but I'm not going to talk about that here because it's done. Let's move on to... Oh, my goodness. I am a total tube. I've just told you about volumetric analysis. That's okay. We'll go back to gravimetric analysis, hey? This is what happens when you're slightly stressed over your videos. Gravimetric analysis is an analysing things by weight. And the good news is most of that is, has already been done in my gravimetric analysis video. I would just like to clarify one or two tiny things here. The two things I'd like to clarify here are this term here, which is tear, not as in tearing your hair out, as in zeroing the scales. That's what that means. So um, if I say to my people in my lab, zero the scales first, then that's tear. That's what that is. And the use of a weigh boat, which is a tiny little plastic boat, which we pop the chemicals into before we pop them into solutions. These are both mentioned in the, gravi in the gravimetric analysis section here, guys, which, as you can see from my notes before doing this video, um, I've actually covered in my video. Again, I'll put a link up here to the gravimetric analysis one. I cover terms like weighing approximately exactly. I cover weighing by difference, which is stupid and is never done. Um, and I cover the actual technique steps that you're required to know. You're, they want you to know the actual steps of how to do this. And it's in my gravimetric analysis video, so I'll stop rambling there. I'll see if I can get the order right, and we'll move on to our next section. Technique number four. Let's see if I can get my order right this time, eh? Colorimetry. Um, colorimetry is a technique under absorption spectroscopy, basically. I talk about absorption spectroscopy in one of my oldest videos, but I haven't actually talked about how you would do it from a point of view of the actual practical knowledge, which is, of course, the point of this video. So a classic one here is, we'll keep it in purple, because a classic one here is the percentage of manganese in a paperclip. That is the limit of my artistic abilities in being able to draw a paperclip. Now you can see why um, I married an art teacher. So what we do with the paperclip is we dissolve it. See, basically, it's mostly iron, but there is a tiny percentage of manganese, MN, in it. It allows the steel to be flexible, in fact. So we turn the whole paperclip, we dissolve it in nitric acid, and we turn it into manganese 2+, plus, which is useless because they're colourless, and we hit it with a whole load of oxidising agents, and eventually you end up with a lovely purple solution of permanganate. And this, because it's coloured, means we can do colorimetry on it. The clue's in the name. And I know I'm spelling it the British way, not the American way, because I'm an old fart. Colorimetry. So, uh, what do we do now? Well, we know there's a certain amount, concentration I should say, amount, sorry for squaring. Um, there's a certain concentration of permanganate in here, uh, but we don't know what that concentration is. So before we can analyse our solution, what we've got to do is make up um, standard solutions of known concentrations of permanganate. So we make up a whole bunch of standard solutions, usually covering a power of 10 of concentration. So say 0 0.001 down to 0 0.0001 of a mole per litre. <laughs> a proper unit. None of this percentage mass rubbish. Um... We pop these into our absorption spectroscopy machine and we will end up with something along the lines of this. We'll have absorption against concentration. And we know the concentrations of these. 
So there will be, if we get the concentrations right, that's the lowest concentration, so that might be down here, say, 0 0.0001, and up here is 0 0.001, and we'll get a straight line between these two concentrations. A certain absorption somewhere between 0 and 100%. Now, all we need to do is take our unknown sample, pop it into the machine, and with a bit of luck, we will get a hit somewhere on this line. Let's say the absorption comes out to be, say, 70% for our sample. We can then draw a line down to here, and then this will give us the concentration of permanganate in here. There are a few points of refinement um, that they want you to know about. First of all, they want you to know about making these standard solutions up. That's your job, obviously, before you do this. How do you make these standard solutions? Well, you would take the highest concentration and you just use a range of dilutions. You would dilute it by 20%, 40%, 60%, 80%, 100%. .00%. The other thing they want you to know is use of what's called a blank. Now, in an absorption spectroscopy machine, before you actually measure the concentration of your sample, you're supposed to put just an empty little container, they're called cuvettes, of just water in. And then punch this measurement, the reset button. So you reset it to be zero with water, and then you put your sample in, and then measure your sample after that. That ensures that it would actually go down and hit the origin here. So at zero concentration, of course, you will have zero absorption. And where do we get a zero concentration? We well, use this blank solution, which is actually water, not air, in fact. That's why you use a blank. And the other point they want you to know about is this calibration graph. So that's what this is, calibration graph. These solutions you made up were called calibration solutions. I'm sure there was one other thing. Oh, yes. Um, they want you to realise that you, if you got an absorption of, say my solution here came up to, uh, let's call that 90%. If my sample here came up to be 98%, I can't assume that this straight line continues. You can't make assumptions because in reality it actually flattens off. So you've actually got to dilute your sample down until the absorption you get is somewhere on our calibration line. So you can extrapolate this line further up than your highest concentration. That's a no-no because you don't know it continues like that. You'd have to dilute this in order to reduce the absorption of your sample. Is that all? I think that's all. We can go on to our last section. Organic techniques, folks. That is our final section, and I've split them up into these six here. There is, I suppose, a seventh if you want to include distillation. But if you don't know how distillation works, I'm not going to use my voice here telling you how it works. I'm going to get you to go away and look it up. However, these ones are perhaps new to us. Refluxing solutions, vacuum filtering something, recrystallizing a, uh, a substance, solvent extraction, incredibly useful, um, melting point analysis, and thin layer chromatography. These may or may not be new to us at this point in time. Let's have a look at refluxing first, folks. Okay, um, this is a reflux setup. We've got a round bottom flask. In it, in purple here, is an organic solvent. For example, some ethanol. It's been heated by a hot water bath or an electric heater, not a Bunsen, duh. If you don't know why you shouldn't be using a Bunsen to heat ethanol, then you're probably in the wrong place. You're also a walking fire hazard in that case. So a hot water bath or electric heater here. And let's see the ethanol is reacting with, well, Classically, say, a, a carboxylic acid. In fact, we're trying to make an ester. There's a good idea. So in here, we've got uh, ethanol and ethanoic acid, and we're trying to make ethyl ethanoate, the ester. Now, we need heat for this, um, and if we just do this in open beaker, then your ester is going to be manufactured okay, but it's going to be rapidly filling up the air in your lab because esters are nice and volatile, so it rises up here as a gas. Uh, what we've got in purple here is a standard condenser, the one you normally fit horizontally when you're distilling things. And um, th in this case, we have orientated it vertically. We've got cold water coming in here, cold water coming out here, which is the direction the SQU want you to know to use it, by the way. The reckon that it avoids air bubbles. <laughs> don't get me started on that. Somebody at the SQU doesn't know their industrial chemistry and they don't know about something called countercurrent. Um, 
So anyway, the whole point of the refluxing here is it stops volatile uh, substances vaporizing right out because the, the ester will now condense as a liquid and drip back into your flask here. Uh, so it can be used to trap a product that's very volatile. It can also be used if you've just got a chemical reaction happening in here and one of your reactants is volatile and you do need to heat it. If you don't put a, cond a reflux condenser on the top, you will lose your chemical into the air. So it traps volatile chemicals, condenses them, puts them back into your substance, into your reaction flask again. Sorry, one thing I missed about this is they actually mentioned specifically for a change, a correct realistic detail on this. There are supposed to be in here some sharp pointy objects called anti-bumping granules. They're literally just broken pieces of pottery. So these are anti-bumping granules. In real life when you have organic solvents they love heating above their boiling points and then they realize oh my god I'm supposed to have boiled and then they super, what's called, they superheat, then boil, and they can literally just jump right out of the top. It all boils all at once. So anti-bumping granules avoid this by providing little sharp edges upon which bubbles can slowly form, and then the substance can boil evenly. That's what an anti-bumping granule does. Uh, did I miss anything else? Don't think so. Technique B, vacuum filtration. What we've got here is a filter funnel. This can be a variety of different ones. It can be as simple as paper. You can have a paper disc. You can have something called a sintered glass uh, filter funnel. They're quite cool, actually. They've got, like, it looks like glass. Uh, it looks like it's sawed, but it's actually got microscopic holes where glass powder has been mushed together at high temperature. It's called sintering. Anyway, don't need to know too many details. Basically, what you do is you attach this to a vacuum pump. Uh, this drops the pressure inside here and there's a constant flow of air through your filter and then what you do of course is you pour your solution that you would like to filter in here uh, and it works exactly the same as normal filtering it's just like a thousand times faster so the advantage of vacuum filtration is it's a hell of a lot faster uh, that's it nice and simple but if you haven't heard of it you wouldn't know and you wouldn't know why we use it let's move on to technique C Technique C, recrystallization. This is a super frequently used one in organic chemistry. What's the problem? Well, the problem is this black stuff in here is something that I've made in a chemical reaction, and it contains three things. It contains the chemical I want, but it also contains a variety, two different flavors of impurities that are mixed up with it. Now, flavor one of impurity is uh, an insoluble impurity. So what I've done is I have dissolved, or I'm about to dissolve my crude substance here in my solvent. And I pick the solvent very carefully. There's a variety of criteria that I want on this solvent. I'll explain what these criteria are once we're done. So I heat this and I find almost everything dissolves in this solvent. There's some little cruddy bits of insoluble impurity left at the bottom. So what I will do is I will pour this dissolved and partially undissolved solution through a filter funnel. If you can do it properly, by the way, it should be a hot filter funnel. You'll see why we need to keep the heat uh, at the third stage here. So what will happen here is your insoluble impurities will be trapped in the filter paper here and the soluble impurities and also the chemical that I want will drip into a second beaker. This second beaker is then allowed to cool. I will frequently pop it in the fridge, in fact, um, why am I doing this? Well, because I told you that I had to pick this solvent very carefully. This solvent has the ability to dissolve the chemical that I want, which are the nice black fluffy needle-like crystals here, but only dissolves my wanted chemical at high temperatures and not at low temperatures. Now, um, what should happen here is, remember I said there were three things. There are insoluble impurities, they have been removed by filtering. There was also the chemical I wanted, which is slowly crystallizing here as I drop the temperature. What happens to the last type of impurity? Well, if I've picked the solvent correctly, the last impurity remains dissolved in this solvent. And all we get are crystals of the stuff, the chemical that I want, which, of course, I can then pop through a vacuum filter. 
and I should actually wash. In fact, yeah, let's do the last stage. Let's do this professionally because the last stage would be vacuum filtration and also wash with a little ice cold solvent. The reason for that is because it makes sure that there's none of the solvent left on these crystals. Remember I said there was impurity in the solvent. It's just dissolved. Well, you don't want the solvent to evaporate and put the impurity on the surface of your crystals. So you should wash with ice cold solvent. Ice cold, of course, to avoid dissolving these crystals. Because remember, we pick the solvent so that it dissolves your, your wanted substance, but only when it's hot, not when it's cold. Anything else about recrystallization that I haven't mentioned? Nope, that seems to be all done. So that's the whole stage. And of course, you dry your crystals at the end and you can measure the per percentage yield. And we're done. What's next? Next is solvent extraction. So what's this? Uh, according to the SQA, solvent extraction involves isolating a solute from a liquid mixture or a solution by extraction using an immiscible solvent. Immiscible means it doesn't mix with it. Classic case of this, I have poured myself a cup of tea, uh, tea or coffee, actually. Let's, do you know what? Let's not blaspheme by using coffee. Let's just use something that I don't mind massacring, like tea, for example. So here is my cup of black tea, which contains a little bit of caffeine. And I want to decaffeinate that tea. What I could do is I could pour my tea into what's called a separating funnel. Or it's now red for some bizarre reason. Must be a Canadian thing. If you haven't watched Nile Red, worth a look, calls that separatory funnel. Must be a Canadian thing. So I pour my tea into here. It's got a tap on it, by the way, otherwise my tea would just simply fall out. And then into here, I will then pour a solvent, an immiscible solvent. It doesn't, this tea is basically water, of course, primarily water and f a few flavor molecules. Um, and I think the solvent they used to use for this was dichloromethane. So this is CH2Cl2, dichloromethane. You then pop a stopper on here. You would give the thing a shake. Um, and what will happen is the whole thing mixes up with itself. And the caffeine, which is reasonably non-polar, doesn't particularly want to be in the water, suddenly has a nice non Well, it's not totally non-polar. No, don't shout to me. Um, but it's the caffeine prefers to dissolve into here rather than the water. So you shake it all up, let it settle again. In reality, by the way, you better take, uh, you better make sure the gas that builds up from time to time is vented. Otherwise, it will blow the stopper right out. But that's not the point. That's not important right now, to quote Leslie Nielsen. So then we keep the stopper on the top. We let it settle out and it will split itself into two layers. If I remember correctly... Dichloromethane is unusual and it's actually more dense than water. And that is a novelty. So your dichloromethane will be down here, CH2Cl2, plus your caffeine. So all the caffeine, or 90% of the caffeine, will have come out of the tea. And what you can do is open this tap, collect, this all runs out, collect your dichloromethane and caffeine, And then the tea will be decaffeinated. I say completely decaffeinated, but it's not because, and this is one of the points they mentioned for solvent extraction, how could you make sure you get the remaining, say, 2 to 5% of tea out of this, of caffeine, sorry, out of the tea? And the simple answer is you do the whole procedure all over again with some fresh dichloromethane that doesn't have any caffeine in it. It's an equilibrium, you see. There's an equilibrium uh, for the caffeine between this solvent here and this solvent here. And which solvent do you pick? Well, you pick one, and they specifically mention this, where the equilibrium constant, the K value, prefers to put your desired solute, which in this case is caffeine, into this solvent, obviously. You'd pick a solvent that's got a high value of K for whatever it is you're trying to extract. And as I said, you repeat the whole process. Take this tea, pop it back in here again with some fresh dichloromethane, shake it up again, repeat this, and now you will have effectively tea with zero caffeine in it. Please don't try that at home because we don't use that method anymore for tea and coffee. We actually use high pressure carbon dioxide, which is a liquid at high enough pressures, which doesn't ever happen in room temperature. Let me check and see if there's anything else. Yes, yeah, sorry, the SQA says specifically, um, <clears throat> they say what I've done here. 
don't use one single massive quantity of solvent. It works better because it's an equilibrium. This process works better when there um, is a, a zero concentration of caffeine in here uh, and it pulls all the, ca the caffeine out of here to balance the equilibrium. Uh, they also mention the solvent should be immiscible with this liquid. Well, duh, otherwise it's never going to separate. Um, volatile to all this. Oh, yeah, if you could pick a nice volatile solvent, it means you can distill this off and just be left with pure caffeine at the end. I never thought of that one. Also, it has to be one that doesn't react with the caffeine. Again, duh. Otherwise, you wouldn't have any caffeine left. We are nearly there, folks. Just a couple of techniques left. Let's move on to melting points. Melting point and purity, which makes me sound a bit on the right wing. No, no, no. Uh, no right wing tendencies here. We're talking purity of substance here. Um, it turns out that a pure organic substance has a melting point uh, and it melts at 135 Celsius, for example, for aspirin here, plus and minus only about one degree Celsius. So it probably starts to melt about 134 and it's all melted by 136. So the smaller the range, the higher the purity of your substance. Which means if we have contaminated aspirin, then two things will happen. I've also I've already implied that it will melt over a much wider range, maybe even 10 degrees Celsius, but the melting point is always lowered. So it's never, ever increased. Don't ask me why. Go and look it up if you're interested. But the melting point always ends up lower. So if I have my aspirin sample, it ends up melting at, say, 120 to 127 Celsius. I can guarantee it is most definitely not pure. And I need to do some purification on it. For example, by recrystallization. That's the whole point of the technique. The other thing, uh, the SQA... So the SQA wants you to know about what's called melting point depression and also a wider spread... And the other thing they want you to know about is the technique called mixed melting points. Now, this is a sort of hangover from the bad old days of sixth year studies chemistry. I'm old enough to have remembered it before it was called advanced higher. So mixed melting points, which again is a technique that nobody uses. Let me explain what's going on here. What the SQA are suggesting here is a way of determining the purity of your aspirin that you had made would be to mix uh, your aspirin with some aspirin off the shelf in the store cupboard. A bit like the control earlier on. So this is store cupboard chemistry, store cupboard aspirin. And what the SQA are saying is that if your aspirin is in fact aspirin, you mix it with even more aspirin, then absolutely nothing will happen to the melting point. It will be 135 Celsius. On the other hand, if you mix your aspirin that you think it is with some store aspirin and you end up with a melting point of, say, 105 Celsius, you can guarantee that what you had was not pure. So it's not quite how it used to be. This is a mixed melting point. It involves mixing a small quantity of the product that's your product with some of the pure compound off the shelf and determining the melting point. The melting point value and the range can be used to determine if your product and the pure compound are the same substance. Totally redundant, since all I would do... I, I can only think that this would only ever be used if you had, say, a chemistry reaction that gave you two products that both had very similar melting points. Then I could see it being a valid way of identifying which substance you had actually made. They'd have to give you this or some sort of weird abstract uh, problem-solving context, but they could do that. They could do that indeed. So that's melting points. Let's have a look at our last one, which is thin layer chromatography. Right, folks, thin layer chromatography. It's very, very similar to paper chromatography that hopefully you've used somewhere else in chemistry in your life so far, in that we have a flat sheet. In this case, the sheet is made of... Uh, glass or plastic, and it has a layer of silica or aluminium oxide. These are mentioned specifically in the outcomes here, which makes me suspicious. They might actually ask you these details. That's why I'm going into this level of detail, guys. Um, so we have substance X that we don't know what's in it, and we have the different colours here representing some pure samples of other chemicals we think it might be in it. We plop it into the solvent. There's a baseline drawn in pencil here. 
Uh, hopefully you can pause the video and tell me why we use pencil, not pen. Duh. Uh, we have an organic solvent here. The organic solvent is going to rise up the paper, it's going to drag X, and it's going to split X into its components as it rises up. The individual substances here will only go... Uh, they'll only form single blobs because they are pure substances. I've lost my blue. Here we go. Let's say blue hardly moves at all. Uh, and we find our substance X divides itself up into a dot at this height and a dot at that height. So we read these chromatograms horizontally, which means it's definitely got some purple in it and it's definitely got some blue in it. Uh, and may even have, say, a dot here that doesn't correspond to something else. There are one, two, three substances in X. Two of them, we know what they are. This remains a mystery. So that's the basis behind thin layer chromatography. Um, the only difference between this and uh, normal paper chromatography is very often these are all totally invisible. And what you do is you shine an ultraviolet light onto it in order to actually see these dots. This is actually treated with a special chemical which fluoresces at, I think it's 285 nanometers, which is pretty short as nanometers go. Uh, so it's quite a nasty ultraviolet you need to actually um, show these chemicals up and they all show up as glowing dots under the UV. Uh, how far the compounds go up? depends on how soluble they are in this solvent. You can change the solvent to drag the dots. I've, I've done this in the past where the dots all end up thumped right up at the top here. That's useless, and I've had solvents where they don't move off the baseline. Also useless. So you change the polarity of the solvent here slightly, more or less polar, to make sure all your dots are somewhere between off the line but not off the top. Uh, the other option for developing them is you can sometimes use iodine vapour which will, the iodine vapor sticks to your organic compounds more than it sticks to the blank silica levels. Is there anything else? Yes, there is something else. They want you to know about RF values. They want you to know specifically how to calculate an RF value. What on earth is an RF value? It's a ratio, basically, guys, and it's a ratio of how far your compound has gone up compared to how far the solvent went up on the paper. So you'll actually see a wavy line up here. I can't pick any of these colors. You're an idiot, hey? So let's do that. Let's say that's the distance traveled by the solvent from the baseline. And if we take the orange dot, for example, that's the distance traveled by whatever substance that is. So we can actually literally crack out a ruler, measure this, measure this, and the RF is calculated as the distance traveled by your sample so that'll be the orange distance divided by the solvent distance. That's how you calculate RF numbers for each of these different substances. Uh, anything I haven't mentioned? Under the same conditions, a compound always has the same RF value, provided you keep the temperature of the solvent and the concentration the same, of course. Uh, that it, oh, you could actually, in theory, you can go and look up RF values in books. In reality, you would never do that in a million years because you can't guarantee the temperature was precisely the same. And much, it's much more common to compare RF values across different chromatograms that you've done in the same day with the same substances. And I think that is us done. Yes, thank you for listening to this uh, Epic Ramble. I'm hoping it was of some use to you guys. I'll definitely have to chapter this one. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye.